There is no debate about racism, because racism is still undeniably a huge problem in America. There are no alternative facts about that. Only statistics, cold, hard, sobering stats. There's the criminal justice system in which a black person is five times more likely to be stopped without just cause than a white person. And black boys born today are six times more likely to be sentenced to prison than their white peers. There's the economic wealth gap, which shows that a typical white family has eight times the wealth of the typical black family. But the central question that Trump and Trumpism raises is how do you convince white people to take racism seriously, to confront it, to combat it? That's the challenge, right? Because one of the drivers of Trump's support, the whole majority-minority debate, is that within two decades, white people aren't going to be in the majority anymore. So Republicans feel they need to stack the deck in their favor. They need to impose rules to put their proverbial thumbs on the scale to maintain power as their numbers diminish. Democracy be damned in the quest to make America great again. Or is that white again? At the heart of the pitch is fear. Trump supporters are fearful. That's what the studies show. And the Donald preyed on that. He sought to channel that fear, fear of foreigners, fear of terrorism, at least a certain kind of terrorism, fear of losing out. Quote, no one will be safe in Joe Biden's America. That was Trump's claim. So is there a way to cut through that self-interest and argue that all Americans should take racism seriously? Well, a provocative new book makes the case that racism is actually harmful to all of us. Heather McGee writes in The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, that racism isn't just morally wrong or inherently unfair. It gets in the way of all of us having nice things. Heather is the former president of the progressive think tank Demos. She's also currently chair of the board of the racial justice organization Color of Change. And she joins me now. Heather, thanks so much uh, for coming on the show. Congratulations on the book. Uh, its title is The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. That's a reference to zero-sum politics, to the idea that progress for people of color will cost white people, will cost them something. Unpack that a little bit for our viewers. So as it turns out, that idea, that zero sum, the idea that a dollar in my pocket means a dollar less in yours, that progress for people of color has to come at the expense of white people, is a dominant worldview among white Americans. And it's no accident, right? That's what they've been hearing from the right wing media. That is the core defining feature of Trumpism, us versus them, winners and losers. But of course, it's the Republican Party's message as well, makers and takers, uh, anti-government freeloaders and taxpayers uh, deriding government handouts. But what I discovered in the path that I took to write The Sum of Us was that in fact, White Americans used to love the government, used to believe that the government ought to have a job guarantee for anyone who wants one and a minimum income for everyone in the country. Two thirds of white Americans agreed with that principle um, up until 1960. By 1964, that support among white Americans had been dropped in half. What happened between 1960 wow. and 1964, maybe? Civil rights movement burst into white consciousness. Yeah. 1963 March on Washington, including those economic guarantees as yep. two of the demands. And so that was, of course, we know the last time after Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, the last time that a Democrat has won the majority of white voters. And in so doing, yes. white Americans turn their backs on the formula that had created middle class prosperity for themselves. And we've been living in the inequality era ever since. And you mentioned both LBJ and you mentioned the idea of a dollar in uh, your pocket is one less dollar in mine. I'm always reminded of that old quote from LBJ on the politics and economics of racism, uh, where he said, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best color man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket, which speaks volumes about so much of our politics in America. Let's talk about what you've referred to as the parable at the heart of your book, the battle over public swimming pools in America. Explain to our viewers what you're referring to there. It seems like a small thing, but in many ways it stands in for everything, for the pool of resources, for the fact that government is what we do together as a people when we simply can't get it done on our own. In the 1930s and 40s, as part of the kind of New Deal democratic commitment of government and business to a high standard of living for everyday Americans, we had a building boom, 2,000 
grand resort style public pools in America. And many of them, like much of the New Deal social contract, was segregated whites only. And when the civil rights movement empowered black residents of these communities to push for integration of these public pools, many of them across the country, not just in the South, decided to drain their public pools. They backed trucks up and poured dirt into them, paved them over rather than wow. integrate them. That's why I call what we're experiencing now this austerity politics that is cheered on by the majority of white voters who support uh, an anti-government tax cuts for the wealthy, deregulatory uh, agenda, the drained pool politics. You're seeing it operate in Texas right now. You can't get more drained pool than that, than a grid that's cut itself off, yeah. cut corners, and now cut out the lights for millions of people. But just coming back to the zero-sum aspect to this, and, and what I would call biting your nose to spite your face, you drain the public pool so that black kids won't be able to use it, but then poor white kids can't use it either. That's exactly right. So then the only kids who got to swim were the white families. There was sort of a boom in backyard swimming pools after this. There were all of these members-only swim clubs where you had to pay hundreds of dollars a year. And really, isn't that kind of what's happened all across America? I talk about the issue of student debt, something obviously very uh, topical in the news right now. This, to me, is a perfect example of drained pool politics. Government used to pick up the tab for public colleges in America, used to be able to go debt-free, tuition-free at all state colleges virtually in the country. And if there was anything left over in terms of tuition, the federal government would give you a grant, not a loan, a grant, free money to go to college. It wasn't charity. It was a smart investment. And as the anti-government tax cut politics began to take over state legislatures as the population that was going to college became more diverse, we switched to a debt for diploma system. Now, this impacts black students most acutely. Eight out of 10 have to borrow because of the racial wealth divide that was created by policy that you mentioned, but it also impacts six out of 10 white students who have to borrow. And it's just bad economic policy decision-making. We can do better. We can afford to invest in our people again without the exclusion that defined the way that we did it in the first half of the 20th century. And if we do so, I, I think you, there's nothing we can't do as a country. You mentioned bad economic policy making. What becomes clear from reading your book is that you can't have good economic policy making in America unless you acknowledge the role played by race. And what's very clear is the reason America doesn't have a strong Scandinavian style welfare state, it's nothing to do with rugged individualism or all those other myths. It's to do with the fact that we don't want those black and brown people having what we have as well. Um, so what's so clear to me uh, is that Trump changed a lot of things. And it seems clear to you too. You say that the election of Trump was a wake-up call when it comes to making economic policy. It shook you in your view of the world. A lot of people say Trump voters weren't driven by economic anxiety, but by racial resentment. Others say, no, the exact opposite. Where do you stand on that whole debate? Or do you think that whole way of framing the debate isn't quite right? The economic story in America has always been told with racial notes, right? It's a song that's always been sung in the key of race. Um, I, the zero sum means that white Americans who you know, are going without health care, are struggling to pay student loan bills, are still voting for the party of their perceived racial interest and against the party of their perceived class, of their real class interest. Um, I talked to folks in Texas, the state with the highest number of uninsured Americans, where there is nonetheless this knee-jerk disapproval of the idea of the Affordable Care Act. In fact, across the country, the majority of white people disapprove of the Affordable Care Act, never has gotten above 50% popularity um, because of its association with Obama and because of wow. racial resentment around the idea of sharing health care across lines of race. So what we have is um, a really simplistic conversation that is so often happening where you get on the one hand, people say, oh, we just have to talk about economic populism. What that misses is that that racial story is already there. It's being blasted at full blast from the right wing. They are always talking about race, always scapegoating, yeah. pointing the finger so they can pick the pocket exactly as LBJ said. And so if we don't call out the zero sum, as I try to do in the sum of us, if we don't say to people, you know what? Some people are selling you hate for profit. And honestly, you may be desperate enough to buy it, but it's not helping you feed your families. And that's what, you know, 
people from so Martin Luther a, King to James Baldwin have said before me. So just on a practical level, Heather, you work in policy making. If you're Joe Biden pitching a $15 minimum wage or debt forgiveness, although he's only promising 10K, not 50K for students, should you not pitch those policies as policies that help black and brown Americans, because that might make white Americans turn against it? Is that the kind of depressing conclusion we come to? So I was so excited that in um, President Biden's first speech on race as president, he explicitly called out the zero sum. He said that we've had this cramped zero sum view of progress. He, he articulated it in five different ways. He said, you know, the idea that if I get a job, you lose yours. The idea that um, if I press you down, then I stand up higher. And he said racism has a cost for everyone. I do think, and a very in-depth research project that we did at Demos around political messaging a few years ago called the Race Class Narrative Project bore this out, that we have actually got to call out the zero sum for the lie that it is. We can have what I call a solidarity dividend politics in America, but we can't ignore the fact that, that those right-wing talking points are always going to be louder in white folks' ears, and we have to start from where people are. So true and well put. The book is The Sum of Us. Heather McGee, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of The Mehdi Hassan Show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.